Now, a question. Um, do you have a clicker? No, no clicker. Yeah, what are you using? Right now? Got it. Okay. Yeah, you also have to take away. Do you know? Yeah. No, because of the screen here. Oh. <laughs> All right. Oh, the camera. There you go. How's that? <laughs> um, do you know if there's a way of um, generating the notes? No, no, no. PowerPoint. There's a special screen for PowerPoint. And all I'm, you know what I'm saying? That shows you notes. Yeah, actually, don't have too much experience. Got it. The PowerPoint intricacies, but uh, I'm assuming it would be somewhere in the slideshow. The slideshow? No, no, it would be in view. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
company, John Paolo, we have recently communicated by email. Yes. Um, that's good. I just wanted to check in with you for a timing of the presentation. Would you like to add before Good afternoon, everyone. We're ready to get started. If folks can take your last chocolate chip cookies and find your seats. Okay, so I'm hoping everyone is uh, settling in. Great. Well, thank you all very much for coming to our uh, Grand Rounds presentation this afternoon. I'm Diana Romero. I'm the chair of the Department of Community Health and Social Sciences. And um, I have to say together with my colleague, uh, Sandra Chavaria, who's deputy chair, uh, and on behalf of, of Sandra and the other members of the CHADS department, I'm really very happy and excited to welcome Professor Mario Small to our Grand Rounds this afternoon. Um, when Sandra and I were talking about Grand Rounds uh, early last fall, uh, almost immediately Professor Small came to mind uh, to Sandra, and then I have to say I very quickly seconded her recommendation um, I thought he would be a wonderful uh, speaker at our school uh, for our department and actually, you know, uh, where hopefully people will see there are intersections across departments here. I'm just going to give a, a, a little bit of background on Professor Small. Um, he's currently the Grafstein Family Professor uh, in the Department of Sociology at Harvard University, uh, the same institution where he received his doctorate degree in sociology. Uh, just a few years ago, right? I think <laughs> uh, a few years ago. Um, prior to that, he um, was for several years at the University of Chicago. Um, his last uh, position there was as dean in the division of the social sciences, and prior to that, he served for a few years as chair in the department of sociology. Um, and his first academic appointment was at Princeton University, um, during which time he took a little bit of a break, a couple of years, and uh, was a visiting scholar here in New York City at uh, Columbia and then also at NYU, where he was collect, uh, conducting research, um, which is described in one of his uh, books called Unanticipated Gains, Orig Origins of Network Inequality in Everyday Life. Uh, just a little bit, you know, uh, to describe that research, he had, and that was specifically in New York City. He explored the experiences and personal networks of New York City mothers with children in child care centers with in-depth interviews and quantitative data both uh, on the mothers and uh, from the centers and showed how much people gain from their connections depend substantially on institutional conditions they often do not control, uh, emphasizing not the connections necessarily that people make but the context in which they are made. Uh, and presenting a new perspective on social capital and mechanisms producing social inequality. And I, I would say that there's uh, a lot of uh, overlap there and intersections with work that we do in public health uh, and, and particularly in community health. Um, in addition, he's conducted a large body of research including but not limited to uh, urban communities, poverty, race, culture, social capital and networks, uh, mental health and other aspects of well-being. His methodological uh, acumen is evident from the breadth of his research employing ethnography, survey design and data collection, quantitative and geographic analysis of large data sets. Uh, just some of his methods publication titles include uh, conducting mixed methods research, uh, how many cases do I need on the science and logic of case selection in field-based research, 
and causal, think causal thinking and ethnographic research. Today, Professor Small is going to share his thoughts with us from some very recent research on social networks and mental health, in which he has written about in his forthcoming book called Someone to Talk To. Uh, the title of his talk this afternoon is Understanding Networks, the Rising Importance, Importance of Qualitative Research in the Big Data Era. Please join me in welcoming Professor Small. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, to all of the wonderful uh, people I've met here during my visit. This has been an extremely uh, productive and interesting and intense visit. Thanks, uh, of course, to your chair and vice chair for a wonderful invitation and a great uh, lunch also uh, just down the hall. Um, so today I'm going to talk about networks. And I'm going to talk specifically about the extent to which and the ways in which our networks uh, help uh, help us and has some kind of impact on our well-being. This is a question that actually is not new. Uh, in the 80s, many of you might remember, this was considered the question of social support, the extent to which having social support or perceived social support could affect your life chances, your well-being, your mental health. Um, uh, there, as we have entered the network era and the era of echoing microphones, uh, the um, uh, the question has become much more about networks specifically. Some people refer to it as the question of the mobilization of social networks, the activation of social ties, the use of social ties, the use of networks for support. That's the broad topic. What I'm going to talk about specifically is the extent to which uh, network science and the way we use network thinking to understand well-being, uh, as, thank you, as we enter the big data era, uh, is in danger of becoming increasingly divorced from lived experience. And I'm going to show you some qualitative data and some quantitative data uh, and some theory uh, about why I think that qualitative research today is increasingly important rather than the opposite as we, uh, as we enter what people have called the big data era. Um, more specifically, and I'll tell you ahead of time, uh, for those of you who are field workers out there, um, I'm only going to show you pretty much cherry-picked interviews that are going to be pretty frustrating because I can't show you everything, but I promise you it's all in the book. And for those of you demographers out there, I'm going to show you uh, one regression and a couple of slides, and that's going to be also very frustrating, but I promise you that I'll also point you to the papers where the published papers where the results that I'm showing you today are discussed in much more detail. So yes, the qualitative researchers and the quantitative researchers are both going to be a little irritated by me, about me, about what I'm doing today. Uh, but hopefully the big picture uh, will at least give you something to think about. So the way to think about what I'm going to do is basically to think about it as a conversation, as basically a conceptual conversation with some data rather than an empirical presentation. In a minute you'll see why I'm doing that. So what is the context? The context is network. As you can see from the many, many bestsellers and volumes out there, of which this is just a sample, we are in the network era with titles like connected, linked, network science, small worlds, analyzing social networks, understanding social networks, uh, the structure and dynamics of networks, networks, network, networks. Networks are really everywhere. Um, and what's powerful and what I love about this picture is that the signal image in network science today is the sociogram. The set of nodes and the ties between them that represent today, according to sociologists and others, today including physicists and economists and political scientists and people in public health, uh, like Nick Christakis somewhere up there, uh, the sociogram represents the way we should understand networks, meaning we are all embedded in a network structure, meaning a set of peoples and a set of ties among them that have some impact on our behavior and on our well-being. What I'm arguing is that there are limits to this way of thinking about the world and that exploring those limits is important. The specific topic I'm going to focus on is the mobilization of networks for support. The idea that if you're embedded in a social network, you potentially have access to people you can turn to for support that's going to have an impact on your well-being. And the particular question I'm going to ask is pretty simple. Within the context of need for support, I'm going to focus on the need to talk as in uh, the thing that people experience when they experience many of life's stressors. You lost your job, uh, you got pregnant accidentally and you're considering an abortion. Uh, you've realized you're gay and you're trying to figure out whom to come out to first or how. You're trying to understand a uh, sudden lump that you feel in your body that you've never felt before. And you, 
in addition to all of the many things you have to do to address each of those issues, you often feel the need to talk. There's actually quite a bit of evidence out there that this makes a difference. Um, uh, for example, one of my favorite studies uh, is a study of um, pretty advanced breast cancer patients who were randomly assigned to um, one of two conditions. In one, the control group, they basically continued with the treatment as it was. The experimental group was assigned to an intervention that constituted nothing more than once a week talking about your experience and thinking about it. That's it. Um, uh, in other words, engaging in socialization with others, specifically uh, talking through the pain, the difficulty, the anxieties about having pretty advanced cancer, breast cancer specifically, uh, versus just continuing with whatever therapy you're already continuing. Uh, in the study, uh, they all died. Uh, they were pretty advanced. Uh, but the people in the treatment group lived twice as many months as the people in the control group. Um, there are many, many studies of this kind. Um, the, the fact of expression to others has been shown in multiple contexts to have an impact on health. I'm happy to point you to the data. This is one of the several cases where I'm going to say, I can send you the papers, but I can't show you that much more. Okay, so, so the question is, how do people decide whom to talk to when they need a confidant? I'm arguing that need, talking to others is essential in many respects, but part of the reason I think this question is interesting is that it's also risky. If the issue is personal or private or intimate in some way, uh, talking to somebody you don't know that well can lead to a whole bunch of issues. I use the example of a health uh, issue uh, because it's easy, particularly in this context, but lots of the conditions for which people need a confidant uh, don't have to do with the topic of health. Uh, one of my favorite examples of the potential consequences in terms of risk uh, is a certain White House intern who many years ago decided to confess her uh, her affair with her boss to the wrong person. Um, and in so doing, the entire world found out. Um, mind you, not all of our issues are going to constitute international news, but nevertheless, the fact that disclosure is a possibility means that choosing is risky. Actually, it simplifies the fact that choosing is risky, uh, which means that we have a situation where something is actually quite useful in ways we tend to understand, and in ways that social science has increasingly, and health science has increasingly demonstrated and makes a difference, but also it's a decision that carries some risk. And the question is pretty simple. Uh, how do you decide? Now, if you're wondering why do we care, I promise that by the end of the talk, I will give you an answer. It's the kind of issue that's interesting, uh, at least to me, from the beginning, but it turns out has pretty strong implications for how we understand social science, the social science of networks today. It turns out there's a standard account out there, and the account is pretty simple. We are all embedded in a network of ties, some of those ties are strong. Some of those ties are weak. Confiding in others requires trust, particularly if the matter is personal, as I just mentioned a minute ago. As a result, people will tend to turn to close family and friends when they need someone to talk to. This is actually not just a standard account. It's kind of common sense. In fact, it's the thing that people will say about themselves as you ask them. So the general social survey in 2012 asked people, say, who would you turn to if you were, quote, just a bit down or depressed? 91% of respondents said, I would talk to a family member or a close friend. This is not rocket science. It's common sense in philosophy. Here's Adam Smith in 1790 in a theory of moral sentiments. He said, since we can expect, quote, since we can, quote, expect less sympathy from a common acquaintance than from a friend, we cannot open to the former all those little circumstances which we can unfold to the latter. Uh, Immanuel Kant, 1780, lectures on ethics. I know this is a public health environment, but it doesn't matter. Philosophy is for everybody. Now, he says, the kind of trust required for true disclosure, quote, can exist only between two or three friends. The idea is we have a small social circle of strong ties. These are the people we turn to. In addition to being common sense, it's actually a common sense that was adapted by a major social survey called the General Social Survey, beginning in 1985 and many years after. This was actually a survey that instituted the very first a nationally representative, uh, excuse me, the question that elicited for the first time the personal network of a nationally representative population. This was in 1985. Um, it was through a mechanism called the Core Discussion Network Name Generator, which was a survey instrument that elicited names from which a network for an individual was constructed. The question asked, from time to time, many people discuss important matters with other people. Looking back over the last six months, who are the people with whom you discuss matters important to you? And so what would happen is the respondent got this question. They thought, mm, my mom. Person wrote mom and then said, is there anyone else? And he said, oh, my wife. Is there anyone else? Oh, Bobby, and so on. That was the idea. 
It turns out that most people responded in 1985 that they had about three close confidants. And we have interpreted that as a representation of people's close ties. The reason people, when they have something important to talk about, will talk to their strong ties, not to their weak ties. This is Ronald Burt, who in 1984 wrote a major paper recommending the addition of this question to the survey. He said, look, the respondent is being asked to focus on emotionally close ties, people you're close to, in which matters that are of a personal nature have been discussed. This is Peter Marsden, who in 1987 wrote the first major paper uh, telling us what the average core discussion network size of the average American was. He says, the case favoring this particular name generator was the view that influence and normative processes operate through intimate, comparatively strong ties. Same idea. You have strong intimate ties, and these are the people you're going to turn to when you need someone to talk to. The first major survey, and going more, one of the first major studies that looked at gender differences in the core discussion network, she wrote, because respondent, because persons named were likely to be those to whom respondents felt close, these data, the general social survey data, can be seen as measures of strong ties, same idea. Um, so it was adapted by a major survey that pretty much the entire social science community focused on these kinds of questions agreed on. This survey has been replicated multiple times in multiple contexts, in states like North Carolina and the city of Atlanta, uh, in other countries, in China, in the Netherlands, uh, really all over the place. It's actually the single most important network question used in international survey anywhere. In addition, in addition to it being common sense, in addition to being supported by a pretty standard and important network survey, it's actually strongly supported by network theory. And in this case, I'm going to actually show you a little sociogram and explain what I mean. This is a pretty standard uh, ego network where the ego, the topical pers focal person is in the middle. And for those of you who already know this, sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to be inclusive, making sure we're all on the same page. So this is a simple a sociogram. Uh, weak ties, so acquaintances and so on, are indicated through dotted lines. I think you can see them there. And strong ties are indicated by uh, solid lines. This is a network that you're seeing here that according to social network theory is extremely unlikely. And the reason is that that particular triad, those three actors and the ties between them is what Mark Granovetter in his famous paper, The Strength of Weak Ties, which is probably the single most cited paper in all of social science with something like 40,000 citations called The Forbidden Triad. And I'm going to just walk you through his rationale because it's going to be important in a minute. The idea is pretty simple. We have strong ties and we have weak ties. Now, strong ties have a certain set of characteristics. First, we are likely to spend a lot of time with our strong ties. Second, our strong ties are likely to resemble us. And as a result, uh, if we have a context in which, um, if we have a context, if we have a context in which um, I am spending a lot of time with person A and a lot of time with person B, since time is finite, it's extremely likely that person A and person B are going to spend a lot of time together. In addition, if I resemble A and I resemble B, it's extremely likely that A and B are going to resemble each other. In addition, if I'm strong, closely tied to A and I'm closely tied to B, but they're not tied at all, this is going to be a situation that's going to feel psychologically straining, imbalanced. And I'm going to, and we're going to want to create a situation where we're all connected. This is why Mark Granovetter believes that this is what should happen. To make the point, he called this the forbidden triad, a triad in which two, uh, if which an actor is connected to two people who are not connected to each other, but they're all strong ties. He thought it's extremely unlikely. In fact, it was unlikely for them to be weak ties. It's practically implausible, which is why he called it forbidden. He was being facetious, but it was to get the point across uh, that that has happened. Really what should happen is this. A strong tie triad tends towards closure. Extremely important. Now, if that's the case, what happens is that if you're trying to get new information, you're far more likely to get it from a weak tie than from a strong tie. Because in a strong tie network, everybody's going to get to one another. As a result, weak ties have the important strength that they're in sources of new information. This is why he called it the strength of weak ties. Conversely, strong ties are really, really good for social support because they're self-reinforcing. And so as he concluded, he said, look, weak ties provide access to information and resources beyond those available in your circle. Strong ties are greater motivation to be assistants, as in when we need someone to talk to, for example, and more easily available. I believe that these two facts 
explain much of the differences between strong and weak ties. So it's common sense. It's adapted by a major theory and it's supported by a major survey and it's supported by network theory. And what I'm going to show you in the next uh, couple of slides is that, uh, oh, before I forget, this is actually quite important. It's also widely believed. Uh, there's an important study by Miller McPherson in 2006. There's a study that showed, apparently erroneously, that Americans are becoming more isolated that represents this idea. They say, look, there are some things that we discuss only with the people who are very close to us. These are important topics that may vary with the situation of the person, help, etc. But these are the people who make up our core network of confidence. Here's one horse and uh, part of the Netherlands team has done a version of the same thing. While people can have many network members and even many friends, they do not tend to discuss important personal matters with every one of them, but only with those they really trust. We will call these people confidants and represent this set of people as the core discussion network. Same idea. I'm showing you all of this because uh, even though this is actually strongly believed, I want to make sure that you don't believe that I'm showing you a straw man. This is actually pretty much the status quo. But believe it or not, it's actually idea is an idea that's rarely been tested. The idea that when you actually need someone to talk to, you will prefer to talk to a strong tie than a weak tie, or that you will talk to strong ties more often than weak ties, that has actually not been tested. It's just assumed because it seems common sense and it's supported by a really beautiful network theory. And to boot, uh, both Adam Smith and Immanuel Kant thought it was the right thing. It turns out, I'm going to argue, that the idea is wrong. I think reality actually differs. When we shift from what people actually say about themselves and their networks to what they actually do, it turns out that they're far more willing to talk to weak ties, in other words, to turn to people they're not close to, than either common sense or network theory would lead us to believe. And what I'm going to show you in a minute, uh, over the course of the next few minutes, is first, that this is the case, and second, I'm going to explain why that beautiful, elegant network theory we discussed a minute ago failed to predict that fact. And in so doing, what I'm hoping to show you is that in the absence of qualitative research that's penetrating and that follows lived experience as it happens, we're likely to generate more beautiful theories that are going to fail in practice. So the first of three parts is the part where I do uh, show you some of the qualitative data. These are interview-based data. Uh, for the study, I chose a graduate student. Uh, this is a study of 38 individuals. Yes, uh, what you're going to hear uh, are data from five full chapters of a forthcoming book called Someone to Talk To, uh, the, in which every single word in those five chapters is based on the experiences of 38 people. Um, that's a shout out to the people who appreciate small samples and what they can give us. Uh, these are 38 graduate students who were interviewed within two weeks of their arrival on their campus, and then six months later, and then six months later, and then again a year after that. And these were in-depth interviews that were both structured components and unstructured components. Now the question is why first year students? It turns out that for a study of, like this, I wanted a couple of things. A lot of the network research, as many of you know from the Ad Health, for example, or the College and Beyond study, a lot of the research, the major surveys out there that have good network data are based on high school students. But high school students are particular, they're forming networks at the same, they're forming networks in the, at, during the pre period in which we're observing them, they're learning how to make ties and so on. I wanted a sample of adults who already had a full life, uh, often had worked before uh, returning to graduate school and had a full enclosed network. Uh, but at the same time, we're entering a period, the very first year in graduate school, that as some of you might have heard, can be difficult for some people. Um, <laughs> this is a, <laughs> I, I hear some recognition. Um, some people uh, find it a, the, the first year in graduate school tends to have a kind of boot camp quality for a number of reasons. It's not just a matter of the department being difficult, it's a question of the fact that you're experiencing major changes in your life, your routines, uh, your comfort zone, etc., all at the same time. In addition, it's a time when people are facing issues with uh, fertility, marriage, children, poverty, health, depression, self-doubt, etc., all of which often prompt the need to talk. Turns out that first-year graduate students often have to talk. And what I wanted to do is figure out what did they do. In the first two, three months there, you had your network back home who you knew really well, your spouse, etc., and you have these new people you're starting to meet. You need to talk. You're going to end up talking to somebody. How do you decide whom to talk to? Whatever you do, whoever you pick, you have to pick somebody, or you're likely to pick somebody. And I wanted to know, understand what they did. 
So this is a group that had a network, had a lot of difficulties, had a great deal of class diversity in addition to that, and were forced to choose. In anticipation of some of the questions I might have, in part two, I test some of the ideas I developed based on these 38 people on nationally representative data from a survey of 2,000 American adults aged 18 to 65. And so when you hear me saying people instead of graduate students, because I'm pretty confident, based on the test I performed after the fact, that what I saw in the graduate students, while unique with respect to the graduate student's experience, was not unique with respect to how they responded to it. Okay, the approach. The core of the approach was to shift from an understanding about what people think about the networks to what they actually do. So many surveys, including in a sense the general social surveys, but many others ask people, you might remember, who would you talk to if you were just a little bit depressed? That who would you talk to is a hypothetical. It's a question which people are asked to imagine who they would turn to. It turns out that that imagination is subject to all sorts of biases, recall bias, desirability bias, a bias towards representing yourself as irrationally. Who's gonna say, oh, I don't know, I talk to any random person I see on the airplane, which happens all the time, uh, but which nobody's gonna admit. Well, only after the fact. So what we wanted to do is get from this idea of your belief about what your network is to the actual experience. And so the way we did it is this. We asked the graduate students, uh, what are the three things that worry you most regarding your graduate experience right now? Then separately we asked them the same thing, but instead about life in general right now. Then we asked them, okay, so they typically said, you know, finding an advisor, money, uh, isolation, et cetera. Then we asked them, okay, now think about the last time you talked to somebody about this issue. Not who do you typically talk to, just try to remember the last time you talked to anybody. They typically said, ah, actually it was yesterday or this morning or two days ago. Then we asked them, okay, that time, who was it? And we recorded that person, okay, who that actual person was. Not who they looked, not who they were close to. The question is reconstructing practice. So who did they talk to? There were four overall responses. And this is the part where I'm going to just cherry pick quotes because I don't have a lot of time, but I promise you there's way more and I didn't just, well, I did cherry pick, but in the book I didn't. I'm pretty convinced of this at this juncture. Here's one example. Here's the one response. The first response is pretty much exactly as Kant and Smith and common sense would predict, they approach their strong ties. So here's Catherine who's married and has one child. Uh, her big worry, the response to that question, was the work-life balance. She had moved her husband and child into this new environment. You can imagine all the stresses and difficulties of, of managing an effective life while doing that, the guilt and so on. So the person she talked to was somebody she was very close to, her best friend, uh, Jenny. She said, why Jenny? She said, well, our kids are exactly the same age, so they play, but we just have a lot in common. A lot of the same issues. This is the idea of homophily. Birds of a feather tend to flock together, and therefore they tend to be close to each other, pretty much exactly as Granavetter said. Uh, we talk on the phone all the time. We're trying to figure out a time to Skype so our kids can also see each other because they're really good friends too. They're friends, our kids are friends. The work-life balance, she says, is one of those things that's always there. How do we balance our professions and families? And supposedly we're supposed to have me time and all that as well, et cetera, et cetera. Pretty classic answer. This is pretty much exactly right out of the textbook. And in fact, Catherine demonstrates why the theories out there have at least face validity because they're consistent with the experiences of at least some people. But then there were other responses. Here's the second one. There were the people who explicitly avoided their strong ties the last time they talked to somebody because they were literally just too close. Here's Carver, who's also married and has one child. When I asked him what his biggest worry was, he was blunt. He said, look, it's money. I just don't have any. I asked him to explain. He said, look, I'm not a very materialistic person. I don't need a lot of things to live, but given my family, now you have to worry about, am I going to be able to afford the rent this month? We've got some savings, but it's not where we would be okay if something catastrophic happened. He talked, for example, if the truck blew out of transmission, he'd be screwed. He said, you know, insurance for the baby is like 450 bucks a month. And the thing is, I'm insured by the university, but it's still 450 if we had a dependent here. Her insurance is to her mother because she, her, she was uh, still not 26. Um, and she can't have the kid on the policy because it's under her mother. It's a huge problem, so we're trying to get Medicaid. Pretty standard problem, it says he often needs to vent and talk to about, about it. Carver had explained that he was actually very close to his mother. In fact, he called his mother one of the people he generally talks to about many, many things, but he said, not about this. I don't tell my mom. I said, well, why? Because my mom would be like, here, have some, have some money. 
So I can't even joke about it with her. Or even if I broach it with my grandma, she'll put $200 in an envelope and give it to me. And I'm like, look, you guys need your social security money. I don't. It turns out they're all poor. Um, in fact, it would not stop, he said. I'd hear about it for the next month. Do you have enough money? How are you doing? Can I get you some more money? And I get my grandma calling. Are you sure you have, more? <laughs> are you sure you have money? It's a classic issue. They're just, in a sense, too close for comfort. There is such a thing as just wanting to vent, just wanting to talk. One of the things I find in the book is there are multiple contexts in which people are basically are facing incompatible expectations with respect to the people that they're close to. If I need someone to talk to, I may want that person to just listen, but instead of them activating the listener role, they're thinking of provider. They're thinking my baby, who's now 30, needs my help. And so they engage in the wrong attitude. You've seen a version of this. Uh, comedians talk about this all the time. Wife says, I wanted to talk to my husband, and all I wanted him was to listen, but instead he got into problem solver mode, and he came, well, lots of you to do is this and this and this. I don't want your solutions. I just want you to listen. Uh, lots of stories about this uh, in our study. Okay, so that was the second response. The third approach is um, deliberately pursuing people they were not close to on purpose. Um, and this was, in other, in other words, it wasn't just that they were avoiding people like their mothers in certain circumstances. They were deliberately looking for people they had good reason to believe would understand their predicament as they understood it. So here's Oliver, who's single, has no child. His worry was the feasibility of his project. It was very frustrating because he was doing a kind of project uh, for which he couldn't move forward unless he got approval from a particular bureaucracy. And he was just sitting there as months and months trickled by and he was not making any progress. So the person here, but it turns out that the project he was working on was a unique project in an area that very few people, in his, even in his department, knew about. So almost nobody could get the experience of how frustrated it would be to have to wait for this particular bureaucracy. And I can't say more about it, obviously, for confidentiality reasons. So the person he went to was just literally a faculty member he didn't even know in another department. He said, look, this guy, the other faculty member, he's really young and he's not yet tenured, so I'm not even sure he's actually going to stay here. And I don't want to lead, deal with a long distance advisor. So it wasn't as if he went to that person because he was looking for a, an academic advisor. But he said, but he's really great and he does work on the same field. I gave him a very similar spiel to what I just told you with all of the anxieties. And I was just like, what do you think? Literally, he's just venting. And I asked him, well, why him? He said, well, because he's a specialist. And there's not anybody in my faculty who does this particular kind of work. So he was one of my very few outlets. It's like the, the scenario you can imagine where, you know, I've heard, I started talking about this, and I hear all sorts of stories where, you know, a faculty member is in the midst of a divorce and goes to a conference and sees somebody they vaguely met at some other event five years earlier, but it turns out that person's also going through a divorce. And next thing you know, they're spilling their guts and sharing all sorts of personal details on the spot because they could, you know, this person, at a minimum, is going to get it. I saw a version of the same thing in my prior book when I looked at how much mothers with uh, young children in childcare centers were willing to share with people they really barely even knew. But there was a fourth option. Uh, well, there was a fourth option, and this is when, uh, in a paper and also a book I just call uh, Because They Were There. So in both of those contexts I described, you had people who were sitting there and deliberating on who would be good people to talk to. Like, well, I could talk to my mother, but I don't want to talk to her because uh, she's going to get too close and too involved, or I'm looking for somebody to talk to. Oh, I know. I'll talk to this advisor, this guy in the other department who's not my advisor, excuse me, but who knows a lot about the topic. Meaning they're engaging in a process in which they're deliberating on the process as they're, before they decide. There were a lot of cases in which people actually didn't do this. In other words, they didn't sit there and say, oh my goodness, I have this worry and I'm trying to find somebody to talk to. They were just talking and next thing you know, they're splitting their guts about something they didn't expect. This is sort of like the airplane phenomenon or the train station phenomenon where you, you know, you walk every time, every time I used to live in Chicago uh, and Southwest is, a, is, a, is an airline where, um, well, with Chicago at the hub. And I, I swear, every time I got into Southwest, I walked out nobody, nobody in somebody's life history and walking a little embarrassed that they sort of shared all of this stuff with me. But here's Camille who's single and no child and her worry was fit. Uh, she was particularly, it was kind of fit with the particular academic department she was in, intellectual insecurity, and there were some depressive elements. And if you're not able to sort of picture what this is like, I'll just try to imagine, I'm asking you to imagine what it might feel like to possibly feel a little bit insecure about your intellectual abilities in a competitive and academic environment. I know it's not the kind of thing that a lot of people experience, but please just try to <laughs> visualize 
feeling like everyone else is somehow uh, doing far more work than you are and getting more done and that you're somehow behind. And if you're in graduate school, perhaps that your advisors all think that you're a screw up or that they're completely pleased and impressed with everyone else. I know it's difficult, <laughs> but I, I really ask that you try to do your best to understand uh, Camille Fredekerman. So who did she talk to? Kind of interesting, because when we, when we realized that they were giving us narratives that sounded good, we started, instead of asking them, why did you talk to this person, we asked them, how did this come up? So this is her answer. There's actually a conversation that sticks out in my mind. It's one I had with Caesar, Cesar, Caesar, a classmate. I don't normally talk to him about that. They're actually not even close. She says, we talked about how we're at the end of our first year, and we have nothing exciting to show for it, nothing exciting to show for it, and no good ideas to go forth till next year. I know, I know, it's, it's kind of, it's the kind of thing that not a lot of people experience, apparently. But it was really reassuring to know that he was also in that state. He just happened, so how did it happen? How did it come up? He said, she said, look, he just happened to, he, she had thrown a party the night before. He left something at my, at my apartment, so he came over to pick it up. And I happened to be in a state of mind, and he was luckily there. He was kind of there, I was kind of there. Next thing you know, we talked. It was the product of social interaction, not a decision. At this moment, I'm going to ask you to sort of think about that question, I, the core discussion network question I had at the moment, where people asked from time to time, who would you talk to? Caesar would not have shown up in Camille's core discussion network. Caesar was just part of her network of, people, of the people she interacted with on a regular basis. And the fact that she actually did this is actually quite uh, understandable after the time, but it's not somebody, it's not a person who one would have been able to reconstruct methodologically based on a standard core discussion network name generator. In some, yes, sometimes they approach strong ties, but also often they approach weak ties, sometimes deliberately and sometimes by chance. And notice, uh, if you're a quantitative researcher and a keen observer, you might have noticed that I'm using the words sometimes and often quite a lot. And these are pretty imprecise terms that give you no sense of the distribution. And that is on purpose, because I don't think that interviewing 38 non-randomly sampled people is an appropriate uh, population for which to draw any inferences about an distribution. For that, you need a survey. So in sum, common sense, I think, may be wrong about what people actually do, and the structural theory may be wrong about how strong ties work. The survey. So what did I do? We interviewed 2,000 people, representative of the national population, an online survey that was selected to match the 2,000 U.S. representative population in terms of race, gender, employment status, Half of them were randomly assigned to the GSS question name generator, and half of them to an alternative question. That alternative question is gonna be the foundation of our discussion today. I'm gonna to emphasize that I'm only gonna show you selected results, and I know that what I'm gonna show you is not fully appropriate to make a compelling case, uh, but if you'd like more, um, the, some of the results here are reported in a paper and published in the Journal of Social Networks uh, in 2003, and in the books someone to talk to currently in press. Okay, so what was the question? Okay, the general social survey asked this question that you just a minute ago from time to time, many people discuss important matters with other people, looking back over the last six months, who are the people with whom you discuss important matters, discuss matters important to you, et cetera. In the CNIA, my survey, what we did is that about a thousand respondents chosen completely at random were asked an alternative question that had the same beginning setup from time to time, et cetera, et cetera, look back over the last six months, but then they were asked, just as in the interviews, think about the last time you discussed something that was important to you. There was a pause in the survey. Then we asked him, that time, whom did you, what did you talk about? And then the survey had a box where they literally entered what they talked about. The answers ranged from, uh, my son has cancer, my wife is cheating on me, uh, the government is ruining our lives, uh, etc. Uh, anything under the sun. After they entered, then the next screen asked, at that time, whom did you talk to? So it was a representation of their actions and who was tied to their actions rather than a reconstruction of their network. I really want to emphasize this. The sample that you're about to see is a sample of last discussions. It's a representative sample of last discussions. And that's how we're going to interpret them and that's going to matter for a number of reasons. Okay, now after they asked that question, then we tried to get, okay, so this is who they actually talked to. Now we need to know who they're actually close to. Okay? So after the name generator, they were asked two questions. One, other than your family, who are the people you would consider, <coughs> excuse me, important to you? 
These may be people you have already mentioned, or they may be people you have not mentioned yet. Either is fine. At least a person who is in, uh, important to you and who is not a member of your family. And they had up to five names. Then they did the same thing. We asked them the same thing. We asked them now about a member of your family. Again, up to five names. So in, and I'm looking at the clock. So in, in total, they could name up to 10 people they were close to. The average person only mentioned four people, 4.2 people. Yeah? So in other words, so it's, ext it's extremely unlikely that there are people that are actually close to out there whom we didn't capture because they had tons of opportunity to name these people. Now the question is, how often were those last discussions with at least one of these 4.2 people? If Adam Smith and Immanuel Kant and Common Sense and Schwarzschild theory are right, what should happen is that the majority of those last discussions should be with these strong ties, and some small proportion of them should be with weak ties. But if the graduate students' experiences are right, well, maybe not so much. So what would they receive? Ta-da! The person spoken to in the last important conversation, a little more than half the time, was actually a weak tie rather than a strong tie. So this is my single favorite pie chart ever because I had this hunch uh, based on talking to these 38 people and a couple of mothers in some childcare centers, and I was like, you know, I wonder if this is right, and I wasn't sure, and I actually suspected it would be like a quarter, which is enough. A quarter, weak size is still pretty significant. No, 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 it was more than half in actual experience. So this is actual experience. This is not what they think. This is who the actual person was in that last conversation. I'm making the point once more. Now, remember I mentioned multiple reasons why this might have happened. I can't, in the time I have left, discuss all of them because it would take too long. And so I'm only going to focus on that middle one, cognitive empathy. The idea that people are explicitly pursuing people who are likely to really understand this particular issue they're concerned about. So how do we do that? So first here, and I don't know, I hope you can see that in the back, here is the topic of the last discussion of important matters. Remember when they were asked to write in whatever it was they talked about? So what I did is I took all of their answers and I generated a code, a coding scheme. Then I took that coding scheme and I went back and I coded all of the answers. Then I gave the same coding scheme to an RA blindly who went and coded all of the answers. And the intercoded reliability was well over 85%. It was really high. In addition, this is actually a beautiful case of replication across the social sciences. Matthew Brashears, not knowing that I was doing this survey, uh, did his own survey in which he asked a version of the same thing. He recorded last conversations. And he independently took the open coded answers and created his own coding scheme. And our five top categories are almost perfectly, excuse me, overlapping, which is great. Family, career, finances, uh, health, and another topic were in his case. So as you can see, family is the most common topic, happened in about 25% of the last discussions. You're gonna see they added to more than 100, that's because some topics uh, were fell into two categories. So if you're worried about your kid's cancer, um, that's a health concern, but also a family concern, so we will be counted on both. Okay, the only big issue to know with respect to the gender differences is that women are a little more likely to talk about uh, about family, and they're also a little bit more likely to talk about health. Other than that, uh, there are no big issues. What I'd like to point, uh, direct your attention to is these four items, family, career, happiness, and life goals, and health. Now remember, the idea was, if I have a particular problem, I'm gonna talk to the person who's most relevant to that problem. The problem is, it's difficult to test this on a survey. Why? Let's suppose that if I took that survey and I wrote my kid's cancer, who's the best person to talk to about my kid's cancer? Is it an oncologist? Is it someone with cancer? Is it someone who has a kid with cancer? Is it someone who has had a kid with cancer? In the next eight minutes, I will give you the rest of the answers to this, uh, to this and other questions. We, we'll get there, right? It's actually unclear. They all could be relevant in a particular way. So uh, the first problem is I wouldn't be able to, in my survey, ask you about the people you talk to with enough specificity to get all those categories. You can put oncologist and person whose friend has, whose kid has cancer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's hard to do that. However, 
However, however, it's certainly the case that if the topic is my kid's cancer, I should be more likely to talk to a doctor than I typically talk to doctors. And so if I look at how often I talk to doctors, and I compare that to how often I talk to doctors when the topic is related to health, I have some evidence that there's a difference there that I have a favor, that I favor people who are relevant and have some possibility of empathizing with my topic. That is the core idea in this topic. So the four categories there are categories for which we ask them about the characteristics of the alters in ways that would be relevant to those people. In other words, we ask them, is the person you talk to a family member? We ask them, is the person you talk to a coworker? Which would be relevant for a career. In other words, not that you would talk to a coworker about anything involving your career, but that if the topic is to your career, you should talk to a coworker more than you commonly talk to coworkers, if my theory is right. But happiness and life goals, there was a question that General Solberg would replicate called an advisor, which is something like a spiritual advisor, it can be uh, secular, etc. And finally, with respect to the topic of health, we asked them specifically whether the person they talked to was a health professional. And so the question was, is the case, where, where the odds of talking to a person in this particular category increased over the how you often you talk to that person when the category is relevant to the person. And here are the results. What you're seeing here are the exponentiated logic coefficients from a regression of um, the particular, the odds of talking to that particular kind of person when the topic is the topic listed. So to be more precise, this is the conditional increase in the odds of talking to a family member or a coworker or advisor or a health professional when the topic is family, career for the coworker, uh, happiness and life goals for the advisor, and health professional, health when, when a health professional. These are separate regressions, obviously. What you're seeing there in the family is a 23% increase in the odds, conditional increase in the odds, and that's after regressing for all of the obvious things that's at the bottom. And what you're seeing there is there's no star because the result is not significant. Basically, even though you're a little bit more likely to talk to family members than you typically talk to family members when the topic is family, the, the difference is actually not significant. So when the topic is career, the odds of talking to a coworker over how much you typically talk to coworkers increase by 180%. When the topic is happiness and life goals, um, the odds of talking to an advisor relative to how typically you talk to an advisor increase by 118%. And when the topic is health and health professionals, the, the comparable odds increase by 475%, and all of those are statistically significant. People do, in fact, do something that pretty much resembles pursuing empathy. Put differently, both the qualitative and the quantitative evidence suggest that when people need someone to talk to, they favor empathy more than they worry about being hurt, which is not the way we tend to understand ourselves. We tend to understand ourselves as rationally self-protective, whereas, in fact, when we finally need to talk, we're actually quite willing to take risks if we think the risk is going to pay off because the person's going to get it. For full analysis, as I said, um, small 2013 social networks. There's also another paper where I co authored with uh, Vani Panfil and uh, Peter McMahon in 2015 in social networks and in the book Someone to Talk to. I apologize to everyone for just only giving you cherry picked tables. I, I know, but there's a broader point that I think is important. So, in sum, so far, people routinely turn to weak ties when seeking their confidence, favoring relevance over closeness. Um, and the last question, and this is a question that I can answer in five minutes. Why was this contrary to standard network theory? The theory was beautiful. The theory was very beautiful. The strength of weak ties theory and the assumptions behind it is a beautiful, elegant theory. So the question is, why didn't it work? What I'm going to argue is that forbidden triads, so-called forbidden triads, are actually quite common in real life, rather than forbidden, for reasons that should have been obvious, but are only obvious after you actually understand lived experience. In a nutshell, I argue we exist not merely in network structures, as structural network analysis suggests, but also in contexts of interaction. What do I mean by that? Remember the sociogram. Remember the strong tie cluster that is consistent with the standard uh, theory about the importance, about the fact that strong ties tend to be interconnected. The question is, how is this possible? Well, suppose that instead of thinking of the world as nodes and the ties between them, we think of people as operating in context. So for example, uh, let's say this is me, and this is my work. Uh, these are my three colleagues at work. 
um, and I'm really close to one of them. I'm going to call that person Taylor, um, just to not cause conflict. And the other two are anyone else. And the idea is I'm really close to Taylor, and the question is how can I be really close to Taylor and really close to someone else without Taylor and the other person being close? Well. Suppose that we think of a separate context in which I also live, which is my family context. In my family context, there are a couple of people I'm not that close to. You're your family because they're family, but I don't really like them that much. Uh, but then here's my wife, Tara. I love my wife, Tara. She's awesome. And the question is, why is it possible? How is it possible for me to be close to Tara and me to be close to Taylor and for Tara and Taylor not to be close? Well, go back to the theory that predicted that they should be close to one another. The first issue, remember, was time, right? If I spend a lot of time with A and a lot of time with B, since time is finite, A and B should spend a lot of time together. Well, if I'm spending a lot of time with Taylor at work and with my wife at home, why should there be any reason for them to spend any time together? Yes, time is finite, but it's actually contextually structured. We spend our time in context of interaction that structure all aspects of how we spend our time there but no aspect of how we spend our time outside of that context. So there's no real reason for that to happen with respect to time. The second reason you might recall is homophily. If, a, if I resemble A and I resemble B, presumably A and B should resemble each other. But I resemble Taylor in my interest in sociology and my pursuit of knowledge for its own sake and my love of teaching and my interest in inequality and so on. Uh, what I have in common with my wife is we're both Latin American, and we both love salsa dancing, and we both love eating, and we both love traveling. The homophily, homophily is not a general thing. Homophily is always homophily about something. The homophily I have with Taylor and the homophily I have with Tara have nothing to do with each other. So there's no reason to expect that Taylor and Tara to have enough in common to be one of your friends. And in fact, they have nothing in common. The third reason, if you recall, was psychological strain. The idea that people don't like the imbalance of being closely tied to one and closely tied to another who are not closely tied to each other. But when I'm at work, I'm just hanging out with the people at work. And when I'm with my family, I'm just hanging out with my people and my family. I don't feel, and Taylor does not feel, and Tara does not feel any psychological strain of every, any kind from the fact that they don't know each other. It makes no sense. In fact, why should they if I hang out with Taylor at work and with my wife at home? I actually understand people as living not just in the network structures, but also in context of interaction, there's actually no reason whatsoever to think that the forbidden triad should be forbidden. In fact, it should be pretty common. And I have evidence. Well, that's my, that's my cell phone saying, you're out of time. So don't worry, this will only take a minute. As I said, little reason to expect forbidden triads to actually be forbidden. Here's a test. Turns out the general social survey can be used to this person purpose. Remember the general social survey asked people about the core discussion network? It asked people who are those people you name. Okay? Now, if, so for example, if I took the general social survey, I might have said Taylor, Tara, and Bobby. The general social survey asks people specifically how close are the people you name? How close are they to one another? If the theory is right, the people should be very close to one another. But if I'm right, if person A is a coworker like Taylor, and person B is a family member like Tara, my wife, there should be no reason for them to be connected to one another because they interact in different contexts. In fact, if A and B tie are a co-worker and a spouse, what I should expect are in fact forbidden triads rather than the opposite. Or at least ties in which they know who each other are, they each know who the other is, but they're not especially close. And this is what you see. What you see here is the strength of the B-C tie, the tie between the two people, um, depending on the type of altar. Uh, so in this context, the spouse and a co-worker, and the left bar is a strong tie. So according to the structural Granovetter theory, the majority of them should be that, right? In the middle are weak ties, and the right are strangers. They don't even know each other. What you can see, first of all, is two things. 
Number one, it is absolutely not the case that the strong side is the most prevalent. In fact, if you look carefully, there are more forbidden ties than strong tie triads. Far more. Far more. Now here's what's interesting. If the context of interaction matter, then what should happen is that in a context, it should make sense. So if I'm comparing not my wife and Taylor, but Taylor to my other coworkers, then it makes a little more sense. Among the sociologists in my department, uh, if I have a lot in common with two people, if I'm spending a lot of time with two people, it's gonna be pretty hard for them not to spend a lot of time with each other because we're in the same context. If I'm really similar to two people, I'm similar to them likely within the domains of this context. We both do mixed methods work, we're both interested in networks, and it makes a lot of sense that they're actually gonna be highly connected. And again, if I'm in the same department, if two people I'm close to don't like each other, that is gonna cause psychological strain. So it makes sense that I'm gonna to try to find that psychological balance. This is what's so beautiful about data, and this is exactly what you see. So when it's a coworker, coworker tie, when B and C are both coworkers, what you see is exactly what Granovetter predicted. In that context, yeah, strong ties are more common, and forbidden ties are effectively forbidden. They're extremely rare. If I'm looking at spouse and other family members, again, very, very, very strongly ties, right? You don't want a situation where your spouse hates your brother. Very few weak ties, and effectively, the forbidden tribe where they don't know each other at all is extremely, uh, extremely rare. So in sum, the structural theory failed because it ignored that people exist not only in network structures, but also in contexts of interaction, something that having spent time in the field becomes completely clear in terms of how people actually live no matter how inconsistent it is with an abstractly created but elegant theory. In some, contrary to common sense, contrary to common sense and standard network theory, people routinely turn to weak ties for support. Sorry, Adam Smith. Sorry, uh, Emmanuel Kant. You can't learn everything from sitting in Konigsberg and not talking to anyone. Second, um, people often favor relevance over closeness. And third, the theory of failures was due to the neglect of context. In fact, there is little structural reason not to go to weak ties. Thank you very much. graduate students, because it sounds like you did a few different ways. Yes. Did you have a way of capturing, or did you look at if who they talked to in wave one, if that weak tie, for those who, who talked to their weak ties, if that propelled the weak tie to become a strong tie then? That is a phenomenal question. <laughs> so the other, t <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I was not planted here. Coincidentally, um, I have the answer. So, um, or part of the answer, one thing I didn't emphasize because as you can see, it didn't make a big difference is that the three departments were in three different kinds of disciplines. One was in a humanities discipline, one a social science, one a laboratory science. And what you're seeing here, excuse me, is their answer to the question, um, this is not the behavior, this is part of an answer. This is who they named as their core discussion partners in each wave. And the, and the length of the bar is indicating basically how long the relationship lasted in that status. So to give you an example, if in the first wave you said, uh, who do I talk to? Uh, uh, Amy, Sue, and Bob. If uh, I never mentioned uh, Amy again, uh, I'm just gonna have to do this. Um, this is the pair that only lasted one way. This is the pair that lasted two ways. This is the pair that lasted three ways. The longer the ties lasted, the stronger the ties. And the more they lasted, the more they exerted what you're describing, which is the situation where people are basically becoming friends. And what you're seeing in the data as a whole is that the majority of the ties were extremely short-lived. In the laboratory department, they lasted longer on average than in the others. But even then, the majority of the ties lasted two, in fact, one way. 
That's part of an answer. That's the part of the answer that refers specifically just to the core discussion network. Second part of the answer, which is more precise, but it's important, this is important to your question, is the extent to which following the action, I decided to actually talk to you, how likely are you then to be my friend or something like that many years later? The truth is, the answers were actually quite consistent. So I recorded the names of every single person, well, in one way, but not in another way. I recorded the names of every single person they talked to uh, about every single topic they mentioned uh, in every single department. It took a long time, my team and I did. And the question is, well, what happened to those ties? Uh, in the first several years, uh, many of those were one-shot experiences. They were a lot like Camille talking to Caesar. Remember, Camille was the one who, I was just in the party and they showed up. But what was interesting is that by the time they were in the fourth wave, which is the beginning of their second, uh, beginning of their third year in the program, uh, those th the people they actually talked to were far more likely to be stable people who ended up showing up in the list of confidence. In other words, at the beginning, it wasn't the case that talking to somebody at the beginning during that difficult time meant that you were going to become friends with them. But over time, they were far more likely to talk in practice to the people who they had actually agreed with a close network of confidence. Now, part of my thinking was, well, this is not too surprising, in part because at the beginning it's a time of change and purpose, but what I wonder if, if I kept following them over time, then by the time they reached the sixth year, they only spend their time, they only actually talk to people they're actually close to because they've become friends with the people they took the risk of at the beginning. And this is part of why I did the National Representative Survey. If that had been the case, then what should have happened is that over time, right, people aren't in the first year in a program but one year, and most people aren't at any given time in a situation that dramatically changing. And even then, as you saw, slightly more than half the time, people talk to a weak tie anyway. Anyway, it's a couple different aspects of the answer, but I hope I answered your question. Thank you for your talk. Do the way men and women establish networks differ? Awesome. So I'm looking into that, right? We don't know yet. Um, there's, there's evidence of certain things. So there's qualitative evidence uh, that women may be more likely to talk to weak ties than men, but the difference is not very big. Um, second, there might be evidence. So one of, the th one of the kinds of data that we have that I'm not writing about the book um, is, um, so we asked, uh, this is, I didn't say this at the beginning, but we went to three departments and we approached every single first year student in each of the, in all three departments, every one of them, and everyone but three people declined overall. So out of the 41 people, we got 38, okay? And everybody stayed for every single wave, except we lost one person in one wave. The reason that matters is that in every department, we did a roster study, where we asked specifically every person, um, how well do you know, or how close are you to every single other person in the department, person by person? We asked them a whole bunch of other questions, and then we also asked them, okay, now here's the matrix, symmetric matrix of the entire department. How close do you think A and B are? A and C, A and D, A and E, B and C, B and D, B, et cetera. So we have their sense of how close everyone else in the department are, is. Yeah? And since we have their sense, but then we also have for every person who they're actually close to, we can compare how well, we can basically assess how well they understand cognitively the department. I'm saying all of that because there appears to be a gender difference. It appears to be the case that earlier, women are more accurate than men in capturing the structure of the department. But I only say appears because we haven't done finished analyzing the data. So I think that there might be a gender difference there. I'd love, you know, in like six, eight months, I might have a paper to send you uh, if you send me an email. I think it's an extremely interesting issue. You know, one thing sociologists call it social skill. It's the ability to read socially a situation, and we can measure that, at least in some respects, in this project. Hi, thank you for um, a really interesting presentation. Um, the, you talked about the content of what's being transmitted versus the strength of the tie, but I'm curious whether you observed like, instances when the same, trans, like, the same message transmitted failed and it's diverted to another tie, the same message being diverted to another close acquaintance. So, what made me think of it is your example with Caesar and Camille. So they could be talking to one another about methodology, right? 
But if Camille's not giving good feedback, is Caesar likely to take that same question to his or her, his advisor? Oh, right, 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 right. So, so, um, so in the in the work following the literature, I made a pretty sharp distinction for most of the project between um, seeking information and seeking support. And part of the reason is. Um, we know for sure, and there's no surprise in the fact that when they're seeking information, people will go to weak ties uh, for structural reasons, but also because there's no risk, or there's comparatively less risk in strictly seeking information than in strictly seeking support. Now, the reason that is not complete, and the reason we didn't stop there is that sometimes, and maybe this is what you're referring to, is that, and so the process you're describing in theory would make a lot of sense in the context where people are just seeking information. Um, in the context of pure support, it's not so obvious. But the reason I'm saying this is because there were times when you couldn't actually make that distinction that clearly. And we talked about those cases as well. Meaning, there are times when you feel bad, because, I'm just thinking of an example, um, you're feeling terrible because um, uh, you're not sure you fulfilled the given requirement properly. And so part of it is you feel bad and you just want to talk about it. But another part of it is, well, you're actually not completely sure. And so you kind of want to find out whether you fill that requirement as expected. And, um, and the question is this, so I'm referring to your question, that in that context where there's some ambiguity, where there might be a, did we see evidence of people making the shift from one person to another as a function of what happened in the first time? Uh, yeah. Um, but given, so the answer is yes. Um, but I wouldn't be comfortable making a prediction based on what we saw in either direction. In other words, I wouldn't be comfortable saying, well, if you first went to a weak tie, then you're far more likely to go to a strong tie, or vice versa. And the reason is, it turns out that the, most of what we saw is that people didn't actually care that much about the strength itself. So we tend to think that before trusting, I have to know that I know you well enough that I can trust you. But when you reconstruct both people's decision process, as we did through the interview data, through a bunch of techniques, and also their practice, what they're weighing, when they're weighing stuff, doesn't seem to be very much that closeness issue. And so, I, so, I did, so in other words, and as a result of that, I, I didn't actually see a lot of evidence suggesting that, well, what they're doing is like, well, I went to a strong tie. Since it didn't work, I'm going to go to a weak tie or vice versa. Um, I just didn't see it. Yes. There's some hands back there, and I don't know who has the microphone. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, um, thank yes. you for your talk. Um, I had a question about sort of people turning to paid confidants. So I'm a primary care doctor, and I noticed that when I mentor medical students or when I take care of older adults at clinics, the students often talk to, you know, depression rates are high on campus, and they speak to paid therapists, counselors, health centers. And older adults I take care of have paid caregivers. Um, and I was curious if any of these students kind of mentioned reaching out to those individuals, because there's sort of this, uh, not a weak and strong tie element, but like almost a paid, there's a different relationship there. And I'm curious if that came out in your data. The answer is yes, and a lot. Um, and I'm glad you brought that up, because I think that's one, sort of a great issue that makes perfect sense after the fact. Uh, but you kind of have to ignore it in order for the theory to make sense. Because <laughs> why would you expect your therapist, to whom you tell everything, to be best friends with your spouse or your mom? It, actually, it doesn't actually cognitively make sense, and yet you would tell a lot to your therapist. So the short answer is we saw a lot of evidence for that. Not just paid professionals, but also um, spiritual leaders. Also, um, people you wouldn't expect, but had the same kind of role. So for example, in the qualitative portion, um, like, the department administrator for graduate student issues. You know, in one of the department was practically everybody's therapist, even though they weren't the licensed therapist, but the, you know, they would go cry and stuff. You know, they had reams of toilet paper, I mean, sorry, tissue paper for people's tears and stuff. I mean, it's not, I'm not making fun of people. It's a difficult time and I'm just making light of the fact that you would think that she's a licensed therapist, uh, but she wasn't, but it was towards there were that um, of course, advisors sometimes, but advisors are a different kind of relationship. So yeah, absolutely, there was a ton of evidence for that. And part of the reason I, I like that you bring it up is um, it is a pervasive aspect of at least how today we manage difficulty. 
and yet, and these are people, and therefore this is part of your social network, and yet sort of conceptually you, you have to force yourself to ignore them for the theory to work, right? It makes no sense to expect your therapist to be best friends with anybody close in your life, even though your therapist will know you better than your mother for many of the things that you care about. So thank you. And yes. Excellent presentation, uh, by the way. And I really liked what you had to say about context. I found that absolutely fascinating. It seems that you also have the makings of what could debunk that um, original social network uh, theory because you're basically turning it on its head. What, to what sort of variable would you classify um, the context that people interact with and decide whether they go to a, str a strong or weak tie? What would you classify that variable type as, a confounder? or a collider or um, an effect measure modifier because we're more likely to do things under a given uh, scenario or, or circumstance than we would in others, just depending on the context. Yeah, that's interesting. So I should say one thing, by the way. So the Granovetter paper that informed this theory was published in 1973. In 1979, Mark Granover himself wrote a tiny little paper in a, chap in a book that nobody knew about, including me. I have found out about it from a guy in the Netherlands where he says explicitly, and by the way, forbidden, whether forbidden trials actually exist should depend on context. He literally says this, and I didn't know this, and I found it, it was, it's a beautiful claim, but then he didn't say much on that, and everyone ignored it. Uh, all of the, every, this idea that strong ties are for support and weak ties are information is like universal in many contexts, Complete, that qualifier was completely ignored. So I should, I should say that, frankly, to give credit to Granovetter for being aware as he was producing a theory of a limitation that everyone has proceeded to ignore. Um, but going back to your question, uh, you know, I have to think about that a little. It's an interesting question. I guess in some ways, um, you know, I could think about it as a moderator in the sense that I would only expect the I would only expect uh, two strong ties to want to lead towards closure if they're in a context in which the parties are interacting together. So in that case, I would guess maybe a moderator. I forget the la moderator language. I'm sure there's a parallel language. Some people call it a necessary condition. There's different languages in different fields, but I think you get the point. Now, whether it's a mediator, um, I have to think about that part a little more. It might be as well. I'm not sure yet. Um, I'll tell you, I'm writing about this now. So I'm writing a review paper. Um, on the broad topic of networks and context, where I'm trying to st struggle with this issue. Uh, uh, specifically, what is the relationship in these, these two things, and how does context affect? Then the paper is not trust, it's network formation, but it's related. And maybe by the end of the month, I'll have something more on that. But the, my provisional answer is for sure a moderator, probably more than that, but I don't know yet. Uh, I haven't thought through enough yet to know whether it's more than that also. But thank you, it's the next question. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you, you, you found that, that um, people are about equally likely in the survey to, to, um, to call on their weak ties and their strong ties and said that they seem to have no particular preference for which they call upon. Oh, but I don't know, from, from another perspective of like probabilities of calling on individuals, if, if your weak network is a couple of, order, of orders of magnitude larger, and that means that you're maybe a hundred times more likely to call on, on, as an individual, to call on that strong network. And so, um, right. I, don't, I don't know. It, it, so, is it actually counterintuitive with with that uh, that assumption that people are more likely to call on their strong ties? Right. So, and I'll make a qualifier. So, remember early on, I emphasized a couple of times that this is a sample of last discussions. Uh, and this is part, as opposed to, uh, so this particular study is a sample of last discussions as opposed to uh, what would have been the case in the, in the random half of the study where people were asked a general social survey question, where what you have is the, is the average person's core discussion network. And the reason I made that point is because a lot of what I'm arguing is for a shift from an understanding just of individuals to understanding uh, under individuals and their patterns to understanding of experiences. Um, a different way of saying what you're saying uh, is that experiences are much more likely, in other words, the actual discussions are far more likely to be uh, discussions about personal matters among weak ties than among strong ties. 
from that perspective, uh, you could say, well, there are far more weak ties than strong ties, and therefore it's not that surprising. And I guess the answer is yes, but I guess it depends on sort of what your prior is. If your prior is people are willing to talk to anybody, then I would agree with you. In other words, if people are willing to talk to anybody, then in a world in which there are far more weak ties than strong ties, just by definition, then of course you're going to see something like this, and in fact it looks small. But if your prior is that people have a decided preference towards strong ties, or your prior is that people only, remember the phrase only wasn't mine. The phrase only showed up a whole bunch of times in the quotes I showed you at the beginning. People, there are some things we talk only with the people we're close to. Uh, well, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I'm happy to show you, in fact, well, this is actually important. If your prior is this, if your prior is, there are things to discuss only with people who are very close to us, these important topics may vary, blah, 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 or where people can have many network members, but only with others they really trust, then it's a completely different scenario. Then, then it actually is a surprising finding, regardless of the distribution of strong ties out there, because you shouldn't be talking, you shouldn't be talking to them at all. So, you know, statistically, in a world in which people are willing to talk to anybody, yes. But that world in which people are only willing to talk, and which people are willing to talk to anybody, is not the world that anybody theorizes. And I think that's wrong. I think we should have seen that. So anyway, I don't know if that answers your question. That's how I would think about it. You know, I think this is funny because if you you would think that nobody would say something this strong, but this is actually the status quo, because this is consistent with a notion in which we are nationally self-protective. I think that's a notion that more represents what we think about ourselves than what we actually do. Hey, Mario. Um, so I'm really interested in how, I'm the last question. Yeah. Can I tell you all that? <laughs> I'm really interested in how social networks um, impact health outcomes. And specifically, yes. I have a large project where I'm studying online and offline social networks and how they develop, um, how adolescents, uh, that, sorry, <laughs> how that impacts the development of sexual agency over time. And um, so, I heard you introduce mental health, and I'm just wondering if you have any data where you can talk a little bit more about uh, social networks impacting that as an outcome. Yeah, so the short answer is not from my study, but yes, from others. There's a, the, if you send me an email, I will happily send you a long list of citations because the evidence is actually pretty robust at this point. Um, so there's a couple of things. One is there's a ton of evidence for an association uh, between social support and health outcomes. And in a sense, what I'm arguing is that one of the mechanisms is literally the opportunity to talk to others. Um, and actually, more than that, the actual talking to others, to be more precise. Uh, there's actually quite a bit of evidence of that, um, both from experimental studies and non. Both um, on the expression aspect of it, literally just expressing your distress, uh, having an impact on health outcomes, to um, uh, talking about it as opposed to just expressing it. I just didn't do it in this context because I, first of all, I'm not a health expert. It's not my expertise. But it's also not the part that I thought was puzzling. Um, but so the short answer is yes, and it's not from me, it's from other, and I'm happy to send it. And I think. Thank you.